profitability is a strange little business element, isn't it? We all talk about it. We all need it. But man, I mean, with your business, do you see it leaking away sometimes and you can't figure it out? Well, we're going to talk today about how we can retain, how we can keep more of that hard-earned money that we, uh, we call profit. Stick around. Hello, everybody. Jeff Mason, your host for Simple Biz 360 podcast, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri, Half Coast Studios. Maddie Parker on the boards. Hey, we're on 28 listening platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, Pandora, all you can think of. And then we're also on uh, IGTV, YouTube TV, and Gab TV. So if you're looking and watching this on YouTube today, if you've never subscribed to our channel, we would love your subscription. Just uh, lower right-hand corner, hover over that curtain. Uh, that little, um, you'll see pinwheel on there and boom, I'll take you to the subscription uh, button on YouTube. And if you're listening to us and you feel we've earned a five-star rating, we just ask your kindness in taking the time out and putting that rating out there. That helps us and we would certainly appreciate if you feel that way, if you could take the time to do so. So profitability, right? I mean, uh, this is really, uh, this is really a cool subject matter. I know we talk about it at nauseum, but you know, there's some things I've learned about this and from, you know, from companies I've worked for, and in particular, one of them called Oxford Industries, that just, I feel like it really showed me a path that I was not traveling down before. I didn't understand that well, and I want to just share, you know, some of these little hidden secrets to you. But I want to start with, a um, in our book, uh, Simple Biz 360, right here, you can find it on Amazon. We, uh, in the money chapter, we start out with a quote from Harold Janine. If you don't know who Harold Janine is, he was the uh, CEO of ITT Corporation, International Telephone and Telegraph. And I believe he boasted um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 years of uh, consecutive quarterly growth of no less than 10%. So this gentleman knew what he was doing, wrote a book called Managing. Uh, if you ever want to go out there and get it, it's a fantastic book. Harold Janine, G-E-N-E-E-N. -E -E uh, the book is called Managing. I'm going to read something to you that he wrote. He says, in business, you want to manage and control the elements of the business itself, not the numbers on your profit and loss statement. The numbers are there to reflect how well or how poorly your business is doing. So he said, look at, at, look at this process as a mirror. You're looking into your business, not the numbers, but the elements that cause the numbers, right? And so if we really think of it that way, um, you'll start to view profitability differently and understand it from a different angle. I, I, I once heard Ken Blanchard, a uh, one-minute manager, I explain it. I believe it was a, a, a cassette tape I had listened to, and I, I heard him say one time, you know, business is like playing tennis. Uh, if you keep your eye on the tennis ball, the scoreboard takes care of itself. But if you take your eye off the tennis ball, the scoreboard gets all messed up. And, you know, it's the same thing that he's saying that Harold Janine is. So the big mistake is companies don't roll their sleeves up, get into the weeds, and look at what's causing their numbers to be that way. They fiddle with the numbers. I've been in the boardroom. I've been around. I've, been, I've seen it. I've heard it. Hey, we're, uh, we're losing $90,000. Uh, what's the answer? Well, let's just take these three $30,000 employees, and we're, we're going to have to let them go tomorrow, and that'll save us $90,000. No, that's not the answer. The answer is you're, something's causing that to... to you know, something's causing that margin erosion. Something's, something's at work there that you're not identifying and pinpointing. So, you know, so how do you in your companies, how do you establish profitability expectations? I mean, how do you come and arrive at a markup and a gross profit that you're going to live with? Um, are there, you know, at the end of the year, at the end of the quarter, do you sit down with your team of people and go, oh my gosh, where did the profitability go? How come we're only making this much money? What happened? Where did it go? Well, we argue that, that profitability is a sneaky little element. You know, it's like, um, 
you know, if you take that handful of sand and you, you bring up that fine sand and you're, you're holding your hand as tight as you can, you'll notice a lot of sand crystals just falling out, right? If your hands are dry and the sand's dry and the sand's falling, you'll see it just falling out. Nothing you can do about it because those are the pennies, the nickels, and the dimes that you're just losing. And business can be like that. We can, I've seen it all too often where we just have all this, what we used to call at Oxford, margin erosion. I'm sure other companies call it that way, you know, but um, there's some sneaky little things that take place there. So, you know, what are they and where are they? So first of all, how do you cost your products? And it's a very interesting exercise um, in the apparel business, which I really started first getting um, acclimated to, you know, really detailed cost sheets, making a pair of pants. That's what we did. Well, making a pair of pants in many cases had a four page, um, breakdown of associated costs. And when you make pants in the Dominican Republic or El Salvador, or Honduras, what we call the 807 hemisphere, Colombia, um, back, we used to, um, measure it in terms of standard assembly minutes. We call them SAMs. So what were the standard assembly minutes? Well, we knew that if we were operating on our factories at peak efficiency, if we really had the place humming, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, that we could make a pair of pants, uh, this particular pant, in 28 and a half minutes. And we had all the different cost buckets that were associated with it. So if we had a problem in one of the buckets, we could kind of know ahead of time where our margin erosion was going to end up cropping up with that cut of garments. You know, maybe not all the garments, but at least with that cut, how is it going to affect our margin? So we could see that. Now, uh, I was also taught uh, when it comes to humming that you could literally, uh, you could walk into a factory and they said, Jeff, when you walk into a factory and I've walked into them in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the Dominican Republic, uh, the Southern, uh, states of our country and you close your eyes. And if you ever want to do this, it's a great exercise. You walk in through the door jam with your eyes closed and listen. And if you hear a hum, you know that that factory is operating at peak efficiency or they're operating highly efficient. But if you hear a clunk, clinkety clank, you know, all over, you know that there's problems in that factory. And this is one of the things that, um, you know, I had a team of buyers, uh, I had to take seven buyers down from a household name, a store you see in the malls all the time. And I had to take them down to the Dominican Republic and we had to walk in one of their factories and I wanted to show them what their, their, their inefficiencies were causing us. And so all seven of us walked through the door and I said, close your eyes and listen. And they were blown away. They were like, wow, this is amazing. You're hundred percent right. This place sounds like a mess. Yeah, it's a mess because you guys aren't giving us approvals on times. You know, you're not giving us what we need to execute your production. You're switching from buttons to Velcro in midstream. Now we got to go out and find the button, uh, you know, the Velcro, uh, uh, machinery. We got to, you know, get the Velcro. I mean, we've got literally, we, we used pod manufacturing at that point, which are little groups of eight, nine, 10 people wasn't line manufacturing. So these pods had to shut down. We were paying people to basically sleep all day and they could see this. So, you know, again, um, there's a lot of margin erosion baked in there. Tons of it. Holy smokes. You talk about losing money, but you know, it, it all starts with how you cost something. If you can identify all the different elements to the cost even your time in motion, your executive time in motion, your team time in motion, how many, how many people at, you know, $40,000 do you have touching this? How many times do they touch it? How long do they touch it? And if you can break your cost down into this and Excel sheet, so easy to do, you just, you know, you can just do it that way. But if you really, um, highlight every single thing that goes into it, you can start to, to, harness the ability to curb your margin erosion because you can figure out where the erosion's coming and you can stop it. But we want to retain more of these profits. I mean, as business owners, we all do. I just did an exercise, a consulting exercise for a young lady not too long ago in her business. And she wanted to know how to cost things. And my suspicion is when we finally got at, to the raw cost, it was $56 and 72 cents. My, my guess is she really didn't realized that that was going to be 
the cost, the standard cost of just making this product. Forget about the markup and the gross profit margin, but now you're looking at a product that's probably going to have to retail for $89, $99. So, it, it, you know, it gets, it gets tricky, but, you know, had she gone out and just priced it at $69.99 and then had someone come in, you know, uh, months later and figured out what her costs were, oh my, you know, $56 to $69, that's not a lot of profit. But maybe $56 to $89, that's enough profit for her. So again, you, you know, we just went through the same exercise. We, you know, tissue paper, she had tissue paper in this product. Well, how many pieces of tissue paper do you have? Well, I got four, okay. How do you buy tissue paper? Well, I buy them in packs of 60, okay. How much do you buy the packs of 60 for? That's this amount of money. Okay, great. Now we take that amount of money. How many times does four divide into 60? And we start dividing into it and figure out how much does the tissue paper cost with each product you're sending out. So, I mean, we got down to tape. We got down to the whole thing. So, you know, th this is a way for you to do this. Um, so, you know, if you can figure out your cost structure, if you can be very airtight about that, you can be very effective at retaining more of your profits and not letting those sand crystals fall out and leak away. So you got to know what your standard costs are. And, you know, is this something you measure? I mean, we used to measure it in terms of variances. What are our variances against the expected profitability? What caused us, if we were going out at 13.5%, um, and now we've got to tell the shareholders that we're coming in at 12.74%. What happened? Where did that money go? We've got to be able to explain it. We've got to be able to correct it. We've got to be able to identify it. And having a, a real finite cost structure, real detailed cost structure, and will help you. And no matter what you do, you can do this. You really can. It's, uh, it, it, you know, everybody that sells a product or service, you can determine to, to a, a, a very um, accurate position, how much time, effort, resources, and money does it take you? You know, we've got, um, we've got things that are really changing in the world today. You know, we, we've got, why, why do you as consumers see the marketplace changing prices? Why do you see escalating prices so much? What really goes into it? Take a pair of boots, for example. Do you know that uh, 24 months ago, a container coming out, a 40-foot high cube container coming out of the Far East would probably be about $4,000. Do you know that today it's $25,000 just for that same container? So if you've got a pair of boots on there or whatever you have on there, I'll just take a pair of boots, for example. Do you know that the standard cost, the container cost for that boot, you know, the shipping and container cost for that boot two, 24 months ago used to be a dollar fifty to a dollar sixty-five. Today it's six dollars and fifty cents to six dollars and seventy-five cents. So that you know, these things you have to be able to monitor these and you have to be able to plug them into your formulas and 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 you know, I mean, if you want to make 22% on something and that's your goal, you know, you're going to have to figure out how your costs are increasing and what you've got to take your uh, prices to, to to get there. And and again, for small businesses, a lot of times we I know, we because I've talked to business owners, we kind of knee slap it. We kind of um, well, the rest of the markets out there for a grilled, um, you know, chicken sandwich at, with fries at fourteen ninety five. dollars Well, um, okay. You know, uh, I'm going to be out at thirteen ninety five. dollars Okay, I'm going to be a dollar underneath them. All right, well, um, is it, you know, what's it really costing you to make that? Do you, have you ever looked at it? What, what's it cost to make that hamburger? What's it cost to pour that soda? Right? Ray Kroc, McDonald's, one of his famous... Um, you know, famous stories was that he wanted his people to sell a bag of French fries back in the sixties with every, you know, with every order. So always ask. So somebody says, Hey, I want a milkshake. You know, I just want a vanilla milkshake. Oh, would you like a bag of fries with that? Uh, okay, sure. Well, the bag of fries was 47 cents and guess what? It cost him two cents to make the bag of fries. So his markup was really uh, quite healthy on the bag of fries. He wanted to pump those bags of fries. Whereas the milkshake, you know, might've been the standard cost on that might've been uh, 92 cents. And he might, that's why, you know, he charged a dollar uh, 19 for it. And he wasn't making all that much on that. But, um, so at any rate, uh, you know, just, I, I think these are interesting exercises, simple Excel sheet. If you want help, 
if you need help, uh, certainly, hey, we've got some consulting programs out there. If you want to, uh, you know, just uh, toggle us, uh, we will definitely help you figure this out if you'd like to. So uh, thank you so much for sticking with today. And we're going to uh, go to an interesting uh, band, uh, 1966, Long Beach, California. A band got together and they called themselves the Dirt Band and they called themselves then the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And uh, they did a, a Jerry Jeff Walker, a cover of a Jerry Jeff Walker tune in 1970 uh, called Mr. Bo Jangles. And kind of a cool tune. It's just got some really good guitar, um, clear, uh, crisp, clear guitar playing. Just kind of a, a cool song. So listen to it. Uh, check, out, uh, check out the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. This is coming from their Uncle Charlie and his dog Teddy album, 1970. Enjoy it. And uh, you'll see it up in the, if you're going to watching this, you'll see it up in the upper right hand corner. You'll see a little card up there. And you just click on that card. That'll take you to the, uh, the uh, video that we've got loaded up for you where you can listen to the song. So enjoy. And guys, we always say if you want to uh, improve the results of your business, why not look at the how you do business? Why not look at the customer experience component of business? It's not always the price, the delivery, the quality. It's not always the features, right? It's how we do business. Are we caring? Are we easy? Do we answer our phone? Do we answer our text messages? Do we, uh, do we limit the amount of hunting and pecking for people to go through? Do we uh, make their job easier? Do we wear the lanyards that have the weight bearing loads on them or do we pass that weight bearing load onto the customers and make them do little mundane tasks it's all these little things that add up to create a better customer experience so the team of horses pulling that wagon for results it is the customer experience so guys there's so much information out there at your fingertips via alternate search engines go on your computer you've got questions about what's going on today in the world you can get much better answers than TV and cable news are ever giving you. Go to the Citizen Journal end of it. You're still going to have some uh, discernment and some weeding out to do, but oh my gosh, you're going from 5% truth to 60% truth and figure out the rest you know, on your own or with the help of friends, but it's out there. We need truth tellers. We do. We're sick and tired of lies. We're sick and tired of lies. We need truth tellers in business, in politics, in churches, and we need truth tellers where it matters. So be a truth teller. Teach your kids to be this. Kids grow up with this aspiration to be an honest, integrity-driven person. We love it. We want more of it. Turn off that TV cable news. Turn on podcasts. I bet you in the last two years, the amount of podcasts out there has doubled. So we invite you, go find one. Pick up a Bible. Man, you want great stories? You, you, you can't even make this stuff up. It is wild. Pick up a Bible, read those stories. Uh, pray. We need prayer warriors. There's confusing times, crazy stuff going on. We need more prayer warriors. And we urge you and ask you and invite you to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And uh, wow, you will get a very, very um, comforting, um, hopeful message in return from our Lord and Savior. So hang in there, guys. We will see you in another 168 hours. Thanks again for tuning in.